from family events to volunteer opportunities to community happenings, there is a lot going on in your community. Learn about all the possibilities and opportunities on this episode of Community Hotline. Welcome to Community Hotline. Thanks for joining us today. Today we're going to be talking about the American Diabetes Association. With me tonight, I have Michael Paulson. Uh, Michael is the Manager in Special Events and Corporate Relations. And Mandy Bentley, who is a dietitian, a diabetes educator, a volunteer, and a Katie Couric wannabe. Yes, ma'am. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for being on the oh, show thanks tonight. Thanks for having us. Now, uh, Michael, maybe you could start out telling me a little bit about the American Diabetes Association. Um, What's, what's the reason for the organization? What's your main focus? Well, our main focus is really to prevent and cure diabetes and to improve the lives of all people impacted by diabetes. Okay, well that's kind of a big big uh, undertaking, yes. I think, because I mean, every time you turn around, there's something in the news about diabetes and how it's become almost epidemic from, from what I hear. Mandy, what, what is your role? What, I mean, obviously you're um, a dietitian and an educator. What all do you do for the American Diabetes Association? So I am actually the co-chair of the American Diabetes Association Expo that's uh -huh. going to be taking place in May. Okay. And so that is my primary role, but I do whatever else that they may want me to. Diabetes is really a passion of mine to help people to learn how to take better care of themselves so that they can li live more of a healthy life. Okay, now I know we have two different events coming up. The expo that you mentioned, there's also a, a diabetes alert day. Yes. What, what, is the, what, is the, what is the main thing that you want people to know? People that don't know anything about diabetes, um, about the possible risks, what it can do to you, what are some of the main things that people need to know? Well, well first, if we could just share that there are 26 million Americans that actually have diabetes. Mm -hmm. That's a lot. Yes, it is. And there are 79 million Americans that have prediabetes. Of the 26 million that do have diabetes, 7 million of those people don't even know it. So Alert Day is a way for us to really help people take a risk test to learn more how at risk they may be, or even if they have prediabetes or diabetes itself. So if someone has prediabetes, that means <coughs> that they are, they're on the path Correct. to getting it. Mm -hmm. And if they don't change something, then, then they're probably going to get it. Is that correct? Absolutely. Yes. What are it, some of those things that they can do to change it? Um, well, there's a lot of things. Um, primarily, um, addressing diet mm -hmm. and exercise can really be a key factor in helping to, to get someone who is currently uh, impacted by prediabetes to get them to go the other direction mm -hmm. as opposed to moving into having diabetes. Right, right. And and sometimes you can change it, can't you? I mean, if you actually have diabetes, can you actually reverse that you, or, or you not? You cannot. So you cannot. once you have been diagnosed with diabetes, you always will have diabetes. Okay. Now you can maybe manage it a little bit differently. Uh -huh. You know, there are different ways. Some people manage just by watching what they eat and being more active. Others need to take medications that are pills and other people need to take insulin injections but there's not one type of medication that's any worse than another. Mm. They're all important. So whatever you need or whatever your doctor has prescribed for you to take care of your diabetes is what's important to do. Okay. So even though you have it under control, it is sort of a misconception. Some people think now it's under control, I don't have it anymore. Right, right, okay. You have it, you have it. Correct. But obviously if you can control it with diet and exercise, that would be the, the preferable it way, would, would it not? fantastic. Yeah. You're familiar with Ken Gordon, the uh, Yes. Yeah, the chef that has a column in the Oregonian, and I always read his column because he's been working on controlling his diabetes through the um, you know, use of exercise and, uh, and good eating. And, I, and I've been enjoying reading that and seeing how, you know, how it's really not, it's not impossible to do that. What mm -hmm. do you, in working with people, do you find when, you, when somebody is diagnosed with diabetes, are they resistant to that change or people pretty much gung-ho and open to making those kind of changes in their lifestyle. I think it's so individual. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a shock for a lot of people and for other people they said it was a long time coming. You know, uh -huh. it was in 
all of their family members had had diabetes. So it's really personal in terms of how they accept it. Right. But you know, it's not life altering in terms of you can't eat certain foods ever again. So as a dietitian, I'd always hear, I'm never gonna be able to eat my favorite foods. <laughs> everything, sure. everything can be eaten, but it's in moderation and being really careful. Right. So people with diabetes have to eat more healthy, mm -hmm. but everybody in America, especially since we just said 79 million have prediabetes, should also be eating the same exact way. Of course. So yeah. it's not a weird kind of it's meal not some plan. funky diet. No. No. <laughs> it's still shopping at Safeway or Fred right, Meyer. Right. So, so the the alert day that you're going to be talking about um, risk factors and and how how you may be at risk. What are some of those risk factors? Either one of you. Go ahead. Go ahead, Mandy. So, yeah, what, so risk factors for for diabetes. What you know? What what are the things that people should be aware of? If I, I there are yeah. certain minority groups that are more prone to diabetes yes, than others. Yes, there are. So the African American, Latino, are two of the larger groups. Also, um, if someone is having some of the symptoms, would be you know if they're having more frequent urination, if they're more hungry, if they're having blurry vision. Some of these symptoms actually can tell you that you may be at risk, okay. that these are areas to, to be concerned with right. and go see your doctor and get a blood sugar taken. Which those can be symptoms of other things, of course, but in combination that it might be something to, to pay attention Especially to. Especially if you have the family history, if you're overweight, overweight, if you're over 45 years of age, if you're not as active as you may want mm -hmm. to be or should be, those can be other risk factors. What about women versus men? Pretty equal. Is it? Mm -hmm. Okay. What about uh, juvenile diabetes? That's, that's become a big deal, has it not? I mean... So we now just say that there is type 1 and type 2 diabetes. We no longer use you know, the terms okay. juvenile. Because it's all the same. Well, you know, type 1 just doesn't develop in the youth. Older people can develop type 1 diabetes too. So the real distinction is a hormone insulin that the body mm. produces and insulin is the only hormone that lowers blood sugar. Every other hormone that we make raises blood sugar. Okay. So in type one, they absolutely make no insulin. And so they have to take insulin injections in order to lower their blood okay. sugar. And in type two, they make insulin and sometimes they make even more than they need, but their body can't use it. And one of the reasons they can't use it is really being a little overweight. Okay, okay, so type one is the one where you're gonna have to have injections. You're gonna Correct. have to give yourself the daily injections. Type Correct. two, you may or may not. Yeah, may or may not, but you can possibly control it with your diet and exercise. Correct. Is that correct? That okay. is correct. Okay. So the Diabetes Alert Day is going to um, give people the opportunity to see if they're at risk. I went online to your website. I did the risk test. Very easy, very simple. Awesome. I was very happy to see I was a low risk. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> um, the Diabetes Expo, that takes it a step further? What, what, are you, what are you doing there? So the Diabetes Expo, it's really an annual event. This will be our 10th year. And we have generally around 5,000 people from Oregon and Southwest Washington that come and learn. Yeah. Funny you mentioned Ken Gordon because he's going to be one of the chefs oh, is he? Oh, good. at Expo. So really helping people to learn maybe how to take their current recipes and make mm -hmm. them just a little bit more healthy. We also have local physicians and psychologists come and provide presentations on topics such as Diabetes 101 or foot care, um, really diabetes burnout, those kinds mm. of things. We'll have health screenings where they can get blood sugar, cholesterol, their eyes checked. There's a space for the type ones, uh, the children to come in and have an area to learn and to play while there's another section, the Jim Hansen Memorial, where the parents of people with type 1 diabetes, the kids with type 1, can go and learn how to help take care of their, their children. Wonderful. So it's a free event. It right. starts at 9 and it ends at 4, so lots of time to come and learn. And where is this taking place? At the Oregon Convention Center. At the Convention Center. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that's on May 4th. Great. Yep. Saturday, May 4th. Okay, good. You going to be there? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> what are you going to be doing there? Walk um, around schmoozing? <laughs> well, a little bit of that, yeah. um, and also um, working with some of our different partners um, to really help them understand the terrific um, services that we offer to the community um, here in Oregon and Southwest Washington, as well as in Southern Idaho. 
And so what are some of the services that you offer through the organization? So there, there's, we offer a tremendous amount of information service, um, a lot of advocacy, um, as well as um, we do a lot of research. research. Yeah. yeah. So okay. locally, um, right now, we have $1.2 million worth of research happening. Wow. Um, here at OHSU and at the VA hospital, um, all around diabetes. And um, in addition to that, we have a few other programs that we implement throughout the year. We have a Safe at Schools program um, where we go in and train um, school faculty and personnel and the nurses to take care of kids with diabetes, oh, what to watch good. for, mm -hmm. um, so that they can feel safe at school and have the same rights as other children and sure. go to the school of their choice. Sure. Um, we have a lot of other different programs um, to engage people. We have a free program called Living with Type 2 Diabetes mm -hmm. um, that's on our website and um, people can sign up and it really helps to guide um, folks who currently have type 2 diabetes um, to live healthier lifestyles. Right. Um, there's a create your plate section in there so that it becomes clearer about portion sizes, what types of things they eat, um, mm -hmm. as well as some um, fitness and exercise um, tips and opportunities. Huh. Um, we also offer a um, step out walk to stop diabetes um, in towards the end of September oh, okay and then as well as a tour to cure which this summer it's bicycle yes yes, yes, yeah, yes yeah. it's our it's our cycling event um, that's on um, August or I'm sorry July 20th great um, at Hillsborough Stadium oh fun yeah mm -hmm. yeah so th there's a lot of help for people out there with diabetes yes. a lot more than there used to be yes you know? and it's um, and it's become so common it, scarily common <laughs> I think that um, that it's really important to have all that help there you talked about diabetes burnout what do you what does that mean you know where you've had diabetes for quite some time and you're just tired of having it so mm -hmm. maybe you don't take as good of care of yourself as you had in the past mm -hmm. and I think everybody kind of rolls through that yeah, yeah. and it's just cyclic um, and so Dr. Fulop is going to come and share some information just how to stay how to stay focused how to stay positive because mm, okay. um, it that is hard sense. when you have a chronic disease something that you have to think about every day yeah. eventually uh, you say you know what yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm tired done. of this yeah I'm done. I don't want to work on this anymore sure that's mm -hmm. understandable uh, we don't have very much time left so what else what else do you want us to know what do you want your viewers to know about diabetes you might want to share that risk test website and how else they can get to it through Facebook yes yeah, so um, so to take the diabetes risk test um, it can be taken at um, w www.diabetes.org slash risk test. Okay. Um, if it is taken between um, March 26th and um, April 7th, uh -huh. um, Boar's Head will be donated $5 per risk test oh, wow. to the American Diabetes wow. Association. Um, which is really terrific, that's and they will great. donate up to fifty thousand dollars. Oh, that's wonderful! So everyone should definitely mark their calendars for March twenty-sixth to take the risk test. So I've already taken it. Can I take it again? Absolutely. Things may have changed, yes. right? Yes. You never yes. know. You never know. <laughs> and um, I think the other important thing that I'd like to mention is that um, I think it's important for people in Oregon and Southwest Washington to know that there are three hundred and fifty thousand people here in our community um, with diabetes. Wow. And there's another 650,000 who have prediabetes. So over a million people just in Oregon and Southwest Washington um, are currently affected by diabetes. So we really want to offer and all the resources we can sure. to help. And that's one in three people. That's a lot. That is one that's in three. Lot. So yes. So people need to be really aware of the of the risk factors. Check mm -hmm. it out, and then you know they can go to their doctor and check out your website and get some get some help and when yeah. you take the test please share it because we want it to be had by everyone so if everybody would take it and then have their family member or friend also take the risk test I think that's a great idea yeah. and I'll a great sure way to do, do that. that is Facebook it is it is yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. and and people can go on the Facebook page then between March 26th and, and uh, April 9th and April 9th and then let people know about it and bring yes. some more money absolutely Good deal Please. okay thank you very much thank, yeah, you. thank you Michael thank you Mandy I appreciate all the information about the American Diabetes Association and the risk tests and uh, people be sure to check out the expo that's coming up on uh, May 4th. Yes. Great.
Thanks for watching this first segment of Community Hotline. We'll be back in just a few minutes with Donate Life Northwest. So please don't go away. We'll be right back. Volunteers are the cornerstone of local communities, and they enjoy the satisfaction that comes from being part of something larger than themselves. Multnomah County invites citizens to participate in projects that benefit the greater good of our residents. Want to help homeless animals? There are countless volunteer opportunities with Multnomah County Animal Services. There's always a lot to do when caring for almost 10,000 animals a year. Our shelter is at the forefront of animal care with some of the most progressive programs in the nation, and we depend on volunteers to keep those programs running. From showing cats to potential owners, to training dogs in the shelter, to fostering a shelter pet in your home, you can help your community by volunteering your time and talents with animal services. To find out more about this volunteer opportunity, visit their website. To explore other volunteer opportunities, contact the Office of Citizen Involvement. Shape your community. Volunteer. KZME Radio is a new station that is committed to entertain, inspire, and connect our community through programming that celebrates local music, arts, and culture. It was created to put local music and local arts on local radio and it is a vehicle for our creative community to gain exposure while also celebrating what the Portland metro area has to offer. Hey folks, I'm Mike Midlow from the band Pancake Breakfast. What's so cool about KZME? Well, it's local music. You know, you can't go to every live show. Believe me, I've tried. So you can tune into KZME and hear a bunch of music that you might not get to see otherwise. Why should you support KZME? Well, it's pretty obvious. I mean, if you'd like Portland Town, USA, homegrown music, independent radio, and if you believe in the powers of rock and roll, then contribute to KZME. It's music where you live. My favorite thing about community media is how people find their voice and tell their story. It's the message of, by, and for a community. We're a gathering place because it gets people of all sorts of different backgrounds underneath one roof. It's art, it's technology. A snapshot of our community. Going live in three, two, one. one. The League of Women Voters makes history. Our country would not be the same without their dedication. Formed by women who organize to win women the right to vote. It is now a co-ed organization. Studying, informing, and acting. Nonpartisan. Grassroots. Influential. Taking political stands on many issues. The League of Women Voters encourages all citizens to be informed and active in government. Join, Join the, the League, League of Women, women voters, voters of East Multnomah, Multnomah County in, in making history, history today. today. Welcome back to Community Hotline. I'm Monica Weitzel. We're here at Metro East Community Media in Gresham, Oregon. And tonight, our second guest is Donate Life Northwest, a very important organization that's doing some amazing things here in our area. With us tonight, the Director of Programs is Judith Trujillo. Thanks for being here, Thank Judith. Thank you. You're and welcome. Tracy Hoyle, who is a heart and kidney recipient, mm -hmm. somebody who's directly benefited from this organization. Absolutely. Thanks yeah. for being here, Tracy. Um, Judith, maybe you can start out by giving us a little information about, um, about Donate Life Northwest. What, what you're all about, what your mission is, that sure, kind of thing. Sure, sure. Um, Donate Life Northwest is a nonprofit agency. We're 37 years old, mm -hmm. and we were conceived um, by the organ, eye, and tissue recovery agencies and the transplant programs to do public education. Okay. So they could do their work, and we do the public education. Perfect. And that's, that was the point. So our mission is to save and enhance lives 
through the promotion of organ eye and tissue donation. Sounds like a valuable uh, mission to me. Yeah, you had a graph that you mm -hmm. brought. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe we can bring that graph up and you can explain exactly what that means to okay. our viewer. So I think she'll bring that up here in a minute. Okay, okay what are we looking at here? Okay, um, this is the national donor gap. The green line is the waiting list. It's a national organ transplant waiting list. You can see it's growing every year. Uh, every year. The blue the blue line are the deceased donors, and then the red line are living donors, like living for oh. living kidney, for instance. And the, the gap is growing for several reasons. One is the need grows because, uh, largely because of kidneys. About 80% of the list is waiting for kidneys. And there's you know, obesity, for instance, mm -hmm. contributes to type two diabetes and undetected high blood pressure which then causes renal failure and need for transplant. Wow. So the list just continues to grow. And the, the um, deceased and the living donors stay pretty constant, yeah, um, partly because there's an aging population. Uh -huh. We have more um, complications when at death that might prevent donation. Mm -hmm. And then there's all, there are good things like safety laws, you know, helmets and speed, right, right, speed limits and that right. kind of thing. Wow. So the the um, the donations that that people make they can be it can be either somebody who has has passed away mm -hmm. either from natural causes or mm -hmm. an accident or that kind of thing or it can be somebody like um, a sibling who donates a kidney mm -hmm. or it can be somebody totally unrelated mm -hmm. correct mm -hmm. do you also do work with the bone marrow that kind of thing or no, is it just organs no in your we organization? work with organs eyes and tissues okay. Um, and then the bone marrow and, and for instance, blood is considered mm -hmm. a living tissue as well for donation. Right, right. Those are separate. Right, and we've worked yeah. and we've um, had uh, the uh, bone marrow yeah. people on so. here before. So tell me, how hard is it to become a donor? I mean, say if I, yeah. you know, obviously, <laughs> I would like to live a long time. Oh, but like that. were something to happen to me and yeah. I were to die suddenly and my organs were viable and could be used for donation, what would I have had to do to make sure that that happened? Right. Um, one of the main things that we do is we manage Oregon's donor registry. And that is for deceased donation. We have 2.2 million Oregonians registered, which is like 70% of our driver population over age 18. Yeah. So that's an, that's, an that's amazing a, yeah, number. That is. Um, but the only about one in 420 or 30 people or so actually can be an organ donor. Um, you register, do not self-eliminate because the decision about donation is not made until someone dies. Right. So people say, oh, I'm too old, I'm too sick, I'm this or that. No, not yeah. to register. Um, so, but in order to be an internal organ donor, the criteria are very narrow. Mm. Um, first of all, you have to die in the hospital oh. for an organ. Oh, Eye and tissue is different. Eye and tissue is mm. different because the recovery period is longer. And uh -huh. to be an organ donor, you have to have a beating heart, even though you are, even if you passed right away, away okay. your heart has to be kept beating right. okay. until recovery can be done. So you have to die in a hospital, you have to be on a ventilator or a mechanical support. Mm -hmm. And most organ donors die from um, a brain injury, a traumatic brain mm. injury. And that's a very small percent of the population. Sure, like, sure. like you said, one in about 430 people or Which so. We had 36,000 deaths approximately in Oregon last year. We had 86 deceased organ donors. Wow, really? Very small number. Oh, that is. So the need is huge. It is. Yeah, we, the Tracy, registry is important. Yeah. Tracy, tell me, what, tell me about your situation. Now, what, why, first of all, <coughs> do you need to have organs donated? Well, in 2000, um, I had my first heart transplant, and they considered it what they called idiopathic cardiomyopathy, which is they don't exactly know what happened. Oh, they really? think a virus settled on the heart mm -hmm. muscle and just, can, just slowly uh, destroyed the heart muscle. Wow. And mm. so at that point, you know, you can't walk very far. You just, you're just not feeling good. Okay. Um, and, and you I was, very old. I was 29 years old at that age, at wow. that time. And um, my mother had actually passed away 15 years before and was an organ donor. 
So I'd been touched by organ donation right. well before mm. I needed one for myself. Mm. Um, so I had my first transplant in 2000. It's kind of almost like it just kind of came around what your mom Full did. Full circle, yeah. Yeah. kind yeah. of, you know, and it was great. I uh, had the transplant, recovered very well. Six weeks after transplant, I found out I was pregnant. Really? Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> and this is one thing they said, wow. don't do. Really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, Oops. my husband and I had been married for, at that point, uh, six years. Mm -hmm. And we just knew we weren't going to have kids. And we were OK with that. And we had our dogs. And we were good. You know, if you don't have kids, you got dogs. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> Something to share with that one. Um, so we found out yeah. we were pregnant, and I wasn't sure if I was going to be able to continue with the pregnancy. Sure. Um, but the doctors left it up to us, and uh, he was delivered one week shy of 10 months from my transplant date. Wow. So he was born on and February 5th of 2000, a little boy, and very healthy. He's 12 years old. Oh, he just wonderful. turned 12 last yeah, week. Yeah, just had a birthday. <laughs> just had a birthday. Yeah. Very active, very normal, very healthy. Um, oh, what wonderful news. <laughs> yeah, we ended up having his heart checked mm. out because he is so active in sports. Mm -hmm. He plays everything that's out there, and he's fine. Okay. So it's not a hereditary mm -hmm. issue. Right, it's not a genetic thing. No. Um, but this last, I would say, May, I started getting pretty sick again. And uh, I was it's during baseball season, and I was telling Judith earlier, um, I would walk from my car to my son's baseball games, and it wasn't very far. And I'd have to stop three or four times because uh, yeah. I had to catch my breath. And, and uh, it's just something that you get used to doing. It right. becomes your norm. But when I went to the doctor in May, she asked me if I was willing to do a second transplant. Well, of course I'm willing, yeah. if, if God willing, yeah, right, <laughs> you know, that right. I, I can get a second transplant. And she said, well, you're not only going to need a heart, you're going to need a kidney, too. Why? Why, why is the that? The kidneys are filter mm. the medications. Oh, okay. okay. And the anti-rejection medications are very tough on the kidneys. And um, it's not unusual that to have, to transplant have patients mm -hmm. need to have a kidney. It is unusual to have them at the same time. So, <laughs> so. Um, I had a couple episodes where I'd go in the hospital, come out. I ended up on the transplant list again um, for heart and kidney in May, um, but ended up in September <coughs> going into the hospital because um, I had had an episode at home where I passed out. Oh boy. And um, they couldn't, I wasn't responsive. And I got to the hospital and the next day I ended up with a pacemaker put in. Really? And <laughs> two days later I was put on the 1A status, which is in grave need. Top, top. Yeah, top of the list. Mm -hmm. um, and I waited in, in the hospital for 43 days uh, to get my wonderful news that I would be receiving transplant. And I got my second transplant, second heart and kidney <coughs> all on October 21st. <coughs> of this last year. So you got both. So I'm just three and a half months out from a dual and how transplant. Are you feeling? I feel awesome. <laughs> you look great. I, <laughs> you look great. I'm back at the know, gym. Huh? I'm I'm walking on the treadmill two, two and a half miles three to five times wow. a week, lifting minimal weights until I get the six month clearance. <laughs> Good for you. Um, but I feel amazing. So how hard is it to get a heart and kidney? I mean it's, uh, it's, it's, it's yeah. difficult. It doesn't happen very often, so. There, OHSU is the only center here in Oregon that will do the dual transplants. Wow. And they do not, I think I was the second or third this year. So <laughs> it's not common. <coughs> um, you are, when you're needing both, both transplants, both the heart and the kidney, uh, you actually are bumped up um, on the list. Um, for kidney, because the kidney transplant list is extremely long, mm -hmm. extremely long, and unfortunately, people are waiting two, three, five years for a transplant. Mm -hmm. but, but kidneys can you can get kidneys from living donors, correct? Correct. correct. But not heart. Obviously. Yeah, and they yeah. they yeah. wanted me to have um, organs from the same donor, mm -hmm. so both my heart and kidney came from the same donor. Do they sometimes do it where you have different donors? If it's at different times. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. All right, you had some pictures that we want to show mm -hmm. um, of your family and, and uh, your life. So maybe we can take a look at sure. those now. Maybe you can explain to us what we're looking okay. at. 
<laughs> well, I love that. <laughs> this, this picture, I ended up celebrating uh, my 42nd birthday in the hospital. And so we had a big party, <laughs> and one of my friends brought in these fake mustaches. So this is my husband, myself, <laughs> my son, being silly with our mustaches. Yeah, uh, this is Christmas this year. So this is just two yeah. months after transplant. Yeah. Wow. wow. And my son golfs, and my husband golfs, and this is at my son's um, end of the year golf tournament. Oh, fun. We went to Hawaii uh, last August. Wow. So. This is before. This is before, before transplant. Wow. And then this was, oh. <laughs> this is in August, and this was right before I went in, uh, like two weeks before I went in to the hospital so, for good. For the wait, wow. And this, we call that deer uh, fuzzy. <laughs> 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 this is myself, my son, and my dog Pesto. Oh, cute. <laughs> The dog that got all the love before the sun came yes. along. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. Oh, that's, that's great. It. So, <laughs> how's, how's your family dealt with all this? Uh, it's been a rough go. Yeah. Uh, my son and I are extremely close. Yeah. So, uh, I went into the hospital two days after he started middle school. Oh, jeez. And so, that was really hard for me. I missed his entire football season, oh. which was really hard. I yeah. didn't get to see one game. Oh. Um, but he's he's a rock. He ended up finding me the first time I passed mm. out and having to call 911. My husband wasn't home, oh. and so he's mm. seen a lot, yeah. um, been through a lot, and my husband's been through a lot. He's been through two, the two whole family has. The whole family has. Um, <laughs> they're just strong. They're extremely strong. And I, I'm going to brag on Trent for just a second. With everything that went on with me during school, he just brought home his report card and had uh, three A pluses and four A's. Wow, so, <laughs> good for him, yeah. good for him. Very proud of doing him. Doing something right. Yeah. <laughs> We're almost out of time, so Judith, I'm hoping you can tell me just a little bit more about what do people need to do to, to join the registry, because okay. obviously this All is right. a very important right. thing. There are three ways to sign up on the registry. Most people sign up through DMV. Okay. You put a donor code on your license. I have the little D on my yeah. You on can my do card. that at age 15. You don't need anyone's permission. Okay. Um, you can sign up online, which a lot of people do now, an iPhone, an iPad, um, or online on our website, website Donate Life NW. Uh, also on a paper form, if somebody wanted a paper form, they could call us and ask for that. Okay, so it's simple, so it's easy, it's easy to it's sign up. It's simple to sign up, and it, what it does is it lets your family know what you would want. And, you know, and that gone, is, families you know, want to honor their loved one's yeah, wishes, and if yeah. they don't know, it's really awful. So, yeah. But if it's yeah. on your driver's license, that makes it easy. Right. right? And the so. donor registry is only accessible to the recovery agencies. The hospital people can't see it at all. They don't need to. They're right. busy saving right. lives. Right. So just the recovery agencies see the, the registry when someone passes away. Okay. Thank you both. I would Thank love to you. actually talk to you much longer because there's so many more questions <laughs> yeah. I have, but I appreciate you both um, being here to talk about this, sharing your, your personal story with us, Tracy yes. and, and Judith, for the great work you're doing there. Thanks Thank so you. much. Thank you. And if you're interested in becoming a donor, it's so easy. Just go ahead and do it when you uh, at the DMV, mm -hmm. or you can go online to www.donatelifemw. Thanks for watching this segment of Community Hotline. Don't go away. We'll be right back with more. Hi, I'm Luke Perry. You're watching Metro East. Over 25 years of great community media. intentions. On our own, we can only stretch so far. But at Rotary, we believe the right group of people working together can make our communities, our world, a better place. Rotary. Humanity in motion.
¿Están, ¿Están listos? Free GED classes. Are you ready? Clases gratis de inglés. Yo estoy lista. Transportation for free. I'm ready. Clases gratis de computación. ¿Qué listos? We're, We're ready. ready. Come to listos. If you can do it, you can do it. What am I supposed to do with all these corks? Turn them into a cork board. What about all these floppy disks? How about a fantastic journal? Hmm, I wouldn't learn how to make cool things like that. Well, come on down to Scrap. Scrap has monthly workshops where you too can learn how to make great things. We provide everything you need. For more information, call 503-294-0769 or go to www.scrapaction.org. Scrap, create more, consume less. Being a star was my guardian angel when my life was in shambles. They helped me find counseling and shelter. Being a star is great. They helped us pay our utility bills. And find health resources. I'm in college now because being a star helped me find scholarships so I could put myself through school. Call 503-823-4000 to find out if Vienna Star can help you. Gracias, Vienna Star. What local community media is to us is literally our lifeline to what's going on in the lives around us. The absolute most important thing that happens in your neighborhood. People's local communities are usually what's most important to them. Because we're the faces, the smiles, the peoples, and the personalities of the community. To not only give people a voice, but to have their voice heard. Volunteers are the cornerstone of local communities, and they enjoy the satisfaction that comes from being part of something larger than themselves. Multnomah County invites citizens to participate in projects that benefit the greater good of our residents. Help provide services to thousands of your neighbors. Sound impossible? 1,700 members of your community are already doing this, and so much more by volunteering with Multnomah County Library. Library volunteers help their neighbors by teaching computer skills, shelving materials, and promoting literacy in the community. The library provides a wide array of services, including lending popular books and DVDs, computer access, and life-enriching activities. Give a neighbor a helping hand and spend a couple hours a week at the library, making your community a better place. To find out more about this volunteer opportunity, visit their website. To explore other volunteer opportunities, contact the Office of Citizen Involvement. Shape your community. Hi, and welcome back to Community Hotline. I'm Monica Weitzel. We are back here at Metro East Community Media. Happy to introduce my guest tonight as Jillian Ruhani, who is an attorney with the Catholic Charities Immigration and Legal Services. Thanks for being Hi. here, Jillian. Sure, thanks for having me. Sure. Now, um, first of all, you're, you're an attorney. Mm -hmm. You're working for Catholic Charities. Tell me, before we get into exactly what you do, just a, a little bit about Catholic Charities and what they do in this in this community. Sure, um, Catholic Charities is the social service agency of the Archdiocese of Portland and we have a range of social service programs that serve Portland and Gresham and the whole state of Oregon. So um, I work for the Immigration Legal Services Program Which is here in one Portland. of the programs mm -hmm. in the Catholic uh, Charities. Okay, so the Immigration and Legal Services, what exactly what exactly do you do? What, what's the main focus of, of that, that part of, the, of Catholic Charities? Uh, we do family-based immigration, so uh, people that want to apply f to have to bring their family members, spouses here um, legally as residents or, um, and we, sorry. <laughs> That's right. And um, we also do a lot of the DACA, the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. Right, we had that yeah. on, on our show mm -hmm. just recently. So more often than not, you're dealing with the, uh, the Spanish-speaking community, is right. that right? Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. that's probably the biggest, biggest group that's immigrating here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have a, um, 
a large part of our program is funded by a federal grant from the Department of Justice um, okay. on the Office of Violence Against Women. And we work all over the state um, serving victims of domestic violence. And m many of our clients are um, Latino, Spanish speaking. So there's a, um, a program that you, or there's something you specifically work with called the U visa. Yeah. Correct. Tell, tell, tell us what the U visa is and, and what that's all about. The U visa is um, temporary lawful status. It's a non-immigrant visa, so people that are here undocumented can apply for the U visa. And to, to qualify, you have to be um, a victim of a crime and have been helpful to law enforcement or the law enforcement agency or district attorney's office in investigating or prosecuting the crime. And, and then you get a... a mm. Okay, so let me state. make sure I understand. Mm -hmm. So I say I lived in Mexico. I came up here with my family mm -hmm. maybe a couple years ago. Mm -hmm. So I don't have, I'm not a citizen of right. the United States. But somewhere along the line, I was a victim of a crime. Mm -hmm. And in order t for that crime to be prosecuted, the um, authorities need my testimony, perhaps, uh, or cooperation? Yes, correct. It could be um, that you've been cooperative with the police, giving them a report, calling the police, or even more so the district attorney calls you to testify and you go testify against the person who perpetrated a crime against you and and that's considered being helpful to a law enforcement agency. But often if somebody is here illegally, they're, they're undocumented, mm -hmm. they're going to be afraid to come Correct. forward and do that, is right. that right? Yeah. I, mean, I would think that probably happens all the time. Mm -hmm. The U visa is going to help them with that? What, how does that work then? Right, well, um, really specifically people that are here undocumented may have a, a great fear of calling the police or sure. going into a courthouse. They're afraid they're going to be deported mm -hmm. or, or jailed or both. Right, exactly. And um, this visa, or what, well, this um, program, it, it works to allow people to come forward without that fear that they will be deported. Okay. Um, so, and it also helps our communities in that people are reporting crimes and being cooperative and going to testify and that way people who've committed crimes will be resp held responsible for them and can... And they can move yeah. forward then. Mm -hmm. So the, the U visa will give them um, a visa for how long of a period of time? How long is that good um, for? It's a four-year non-immigrant status, so it gives you permission to live in the United States and work here for four years. Okay. And then after three years, the person can apply for their permanent residency to get a green card. Oh, okay. Okay, good. So how do people find out about that? If, if, if I were, you know, if I were in that situation and I were a victim of, of domestic violence or some kind of a crime or something mm -hmm. like that and I wanted to call the police, and how, how do people know that, that that's an option available to them? Right. Well, a lot of people now, it's kind of, um, people are hearing about it from family members who... Or word of mouth. Word of mouth. And then we, we work with, Catholic Charities works with uh, domestic violence and social service agencies across the mm. state. We get a clients that way um, okay, so. that are referred to us, and oftentimes the district attorney's office will say, "You, it's possible you qualify for a U visa," and people will come to us that way to find Good. out. Good. Give me, give me an example if you can, without obviously naming names of maybe some situations that um, people have been in where they have been able to get the U visa mm -hmm. and and how that's worked out. Well. Um, I spoke with a woman, I did a consultation with a woman who lives in a small town and she had been sexually assaulted and came forward, call, called the police, made a report and um, she qualifies for the U visa and, and more importantly after that seven other victims came forward to say that this... Of the same... Of the same... Uh, th that had been assaulted by the same man and their, you know, well-known figure in their community and that gave them the courage to come forward. So you can see how it helps people directly, but it also helps everybody. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, that's a, a huge boon to the community mm -hmm. right there. Because um, that would be a scary thing, yeah, I think. Yeah, definitely. So is there, um, when, when somebody is, is here and is um, undocumented mm -hmm. and they have other questions, say, say aside from the U visa, mm -hmm. Catholic Charity has attorneys such as yourself that can help them out? Yeah, we do. Uh, we have consultations with people where we go over their entire history of when they arrived and um, sometimes people have status that they don't know about. Maybe they're a resident and some, cause as a child somebody applied for them or something. But oh. we do a full consultation to see what options are available to them. Maybe it's the U visa, it could be something else. 
and then they go from there. What, what's important for people to know that uh, people that are here um, that are not here legally and they need to get, they want to get some legal advice, what, what are some important things for them to know? Because I imagine there are mm -hmm. people out there that will give them advice that is not good. Yeah, definitely. It's very important to make sure um, you find somebody who's qualified to give you advice such as an accredited nonprofit such as Catholic Charities mm, okay. or a private immigration attorney who has experience doing um, these types of cases because there's a lot of bad advice out there. Yeah, I mean imagine if you have somebody mm -hmm. that basically is, um, you know, uh, only works with, um, you know, hit and run car accidents yeah. or something, right. maybe they won't have any experience mm -hmm. in. And language can yeah. be a barrier too. Sure, sometimes. sure. So at, at Catholic Charities you have plenty of Spanish speaking mm -hmm. help and, we all speak and some Spanish. other, pardon? Yeah, we all speak Spanish in our office, we're fully bilingual oh, office. Great. And so a couple other languages too. We, uh, we speak vi Vietnamese and Farsi in our office great. as well. Great. So um, what, what else do you think um, people should know about the U visa or about the services that Catholic Charities offers through your legal immigration services? Uh, well, the, I, it's important for people to know that this exists and there is help for victims of crime. Specifically, we do a lot of um, work with victims of domestic violence. Mm -hmm. And um, the work we do at Catholic Charities, we think it's really important because of the obvious link to um, being undocumented and poverty and just kind of trying to break that, that cycle of violence and for people right. to be able to move forward. And right. So if people are interested, they can go to your website? To they can go to our website. It's catholiccharitiesoregon.org. Mm -hmm. um, or they can call our office. We do. Uh, we have a call-in day the first Tuesday of every month at 9 o'clock. They can call in to schedule a consultation with us. Oh, okay. Can, do you know what some of the other services are that Catholic Charities offers? But we have, yeah, we have um, a program. There's a program called Pregnancy, Pregnancy Support. Uh, for pregnant women who may need support. Mm -hmm. We have a housing transitions program for homeless people. Mm -hmm. We have a refugee resettlement program that does a lot of great work in our community I with the new, that's a big newly program. arrived refugees. Mm -hmm. uh, refugees from all over the world? All over. Mm -hmm. Do you know, I have any idea how many different uh, I, groups I'm you I'm sorry, I don't. I, I didn't expect you, yeah. that's not your area, yeah. but I bet that, yeah. I mean, in Portland alone, I know out in the Reynolds School mm -hmm. District, they have like, Seventy different languages spoken yeah. in their school alone. Mm -hmm. I just can't even imagine how hard so. that would be for people to come here and try to assimilate into the community mm -hmm. with, <laughs> yeah. with you don't speak the language. We also have a great program that works a lot in Gresham, El Programa Hispano mm -hmm. and Unica. Yeah. Yes, I'm familiar with them. And they do terrific work. Yeah. yeah, yeah. They do a lot of work. Yeah. We actually had some of the kids out here um, that were brought from El Programa Hispano and did the um, little. Uh, Camp with them. Oh, that's great. Yeah, that was great. Mm. It, tell me anything else that we need to know before I let you go here, before we run out of time, Julian. U visa is just the letter U. It's the letter U. Okay, yeah. so we can check it out online. <laughs> Thanks so much for being here, Thank and you. I appreciate you taking the time. This is Monica Weitzel. We're at Metro East Community Media. You've been watching Community Hotline. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week.
KZME Radio is a new station that is committed to entertain, inspire, and connect our community through programming that celebrates local music, arts, and culture. It was created to put local music and local arts on local radio, and it is a vehicle for our creative community to gain exposure while also celebrating what the Portland metro area has to offer. I search for things. Hi, I'm Allie Wesley, and I love KZME because it's a great resource to find out about awesome music in our community. They have hip hop and uh, pop and chamber folk and pretty acoustic music, and they have everything that we have in Northwest. You should support KZME to support these local artists and the awesome music that you can find. For more information on how to support and get involved with 1071 FM KZME Radio, see our website. When disaster strikes, emergency professionals may be overwhelmed. Can you care for yourself and loved ones until help arrives? Can you help neighbors amidst the chaos? Are you ready? Get ready. Join a community emergency response team and learn skills that will save lives. The City of Gresham offers free CERT training. Sign up for the next class and get ready. What is it like to have a loved one die? Each month, over 300 children and teens who have experienced a death turn to the Dougie Center for Grieving Children. Inside, they find a safe place where they can share their experiences and move through the grieving process. The programs at the Dougie Center are funded by private donations. Thank you for making it possible for kids like me to attend groups free of charge. The Dougie Center, because grief comes in all sizes. This is the story about a group of kids who volunteer. Do something nice for someone. We fix stuff. Did some art projects with the kids. We fixed up this house. We worked in the woods. Cleaned up the park. Did something for the planet. We just did it. No other reason. And you know what? It was great. At first, they didn't know each other. Well, that didn't last long. This guy is really funny. Me? Ace are my new friends. Are you into it? Call 4-H or check out our website at areyouintoit.com. If you are experiencing physical, emotional, or sexual abuse, help is available. I'm scared. He's been beating on me. If you need help, or if you want to help stop domestic abuse, call our crisis line at 503-281-2442. You don't have to be alone. Make a call that could save your life. Bradley Engel House, providing hope and safety for more than 30 years. This may look like just a meal to you. To an elderly person in your community, Meals on Wheels is a social and nutritional lifeline. Many seniors can't leave their homes to buy food and have no family nearby. Sometimes their Meals on Wheels driver is the only other person they see all day. It takes just a few hours to help deliver much more than a meal. To find out how you can help, call 503-736-6325. Mm-hmm. 